Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Build the Future of Daily Care Together. My name is Lithranya Jefferson, and I am a mom to a budding teenager with CF. Well, I'll be moderating the session today, and I'll be introducing our other speakers in just a moment. The session is also being recorded and will be available to all registrants after the event on the CF Foundation YouTube channel. You'll be notified by email when session recordings are available. Before we get started with the session, I want to go over a few items related to the technology and how we can all interact. First, closed captioning is available. You can turn them on by moving your mouse over the video feed and clicking the CC icon that will pop up at the bottom of the screen. Under the stage tab on the right side of your screen, you'll notice the chat for everyone who is in this session. If you're in the event tab chat, that is the full event and not specific to this session. So be sure you're in the correct chat to engage with others in this session. We'll be taking audience questions during this session. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time in the Q&A box. You can find the Q&A by making sure you're in the stage tab on the right side of your screen. Then select Q&A. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. You can also like questions submitted in the Q&A by others, which will help us prioritize based on popularity. Make sure you use the Q&A box to submit questions, not the group chat where questions may be missed. We won't be able to answer questions about individual diagnoses or treatment plans, but we encourage you to use the information you learned today to have conversations with your care team. If you have any technology problems during the session, please click the help icon under the Expo tab on the left side of your screen. CF Foundation IT support are there to help you if you have any trouble during the event. There will also be a few polling questions from us panelists, which you will be prompted to answer throughout the session. These polling questions will help us get an idea of who everyone is and what you're excited to learn about today. Polls can be found on the right side of your screen next to the Q&A chat. Our speakers for this session are Cynthia Brown, Emily Muther, and Shine Ann Pye. Here are all the disclosure, disclosures for our speakers for this session. You may see a poll on your screen. Please take a second to answer it and we'll share the results in a moment. We'll post another quick poll in a few moments. Shine Ann Pye is a research therapist and a member of the care team and we're going to, if you're ready, Cheyenne, get this session started. Oh, thank you so much, Sathrania, for that great beginning. Uh, my name is Shiny Ann Pai. I'm a respiratory therapist and a pediatric program coordinator. Thank you for having me. Um, as we begin, I want to dive in a little deeper with you, Lathrania, into what you wrote in your blog. As a clinician, I noticed that children with CF from newborn to about mid-elementary school age usually have a pretty good management in their daily treatment care, uh, mostly probably attribute to their parents being vigilant and making sure that their child is taken care of. However, in your blog, you know, mentioned that your son, Caleb, uh, somewhere along the way, uh, started losing uh, control and they want to take control over. So what I'm trying to ask is how did you handle that with Caleb, you know, about the ways of children wanting control and, you know, for example, like that, because other parents have told me that their kids have hide their pills or lose their pills or sometimes even put their vest treatment on teddy bears. So tell me more about how you and your son tackle this together. I think one of the things as adults, we forget that children are just many versions of ourselves. You know, just like we like to control things, they like to control, you know, things in their lives. And one of the things that I found that my son, when he was six, uh, his way of showing control was to hide his medicine. Um, kids that age, they want to be just like their friends. And when they realize that their friends are not taking meds like them, they decide not to as well. And that was Caleb's way of showing he wanted control. That must have been really hard to know that your child was hiding his medicine from you. 
So how were you able to have this difficult conversation with him when you found out? I mean, tell me more about how your partnership to gain trust with each other and working together on a customizing a plan that worked. When I discovered that Caleb was hiding his medicine stash, I was angry um, to find out that he's not taking his medicine. And I kept having these eye moments. And then I realized I needed to figure out a way to explain to him that taking these meds were important. I have to kind of step out of being mom and accept that telling him take this because I said so was the way to go. And that wasn't going to work with him. As a fellow mom, I can totally understand why you'd be angry. But um, I have another question, though, as a fellow mom. Were you ever afraid of the I felt as a mom syndrome? If so, how were you able to overcome that and be transparent with your son about your feelings? <laughs> um, there's no past tense in the failed as a mom question. I think you, as a mom as well, you probably have that as well. That is an everyday thought that I have with him as I struggle you know, trying to give him the sense of independence that he wants and me not wanting to really give it to him, but learning that in order for this to work, I had to give it up. You know, honestly, what got me to go through, to get through this was, you know, was prayer. I prayed, God, please guide me to be the best parent for Caleb. I don't know how to do this. So I need you to help me, help me to understand what he's going through and guide me to the words and actions that will allow me to help him, help me help him. Oh my gosh. Wow. That was so powerful. So Caleb knows that you're basically his safety net. Uh, what a really comforting thought and way to help support him. So during this time, how did you bring this up with your care team? Was Caleb part of that conversation as well? I mean, myself being part of the care team, I'm curious on how we can better partner up with patients and families like yours as they struggle through similar situations. You know, when we're at a clinic, I try not to not to talk. I had to train the care team members not to talk to me because I'm not the one with cystic fibrosis. I've always encouraged Caleb to speak and say what he's thinking, especially in clinic. Um, I think the icebreaker for him was when they asked him about his poop. He knows I hate saying or talking about poop. So it started out as a way to make me cringe, but it then turned into talking about other parts of his care. I love how you incorporate the various disciplines in the, um, their discussion with Caleb. As a respiratory therapist, I am not sure if I want to talk about poop either. <laughs> but um, was research ever a part of that conversation? If so, how did you introduce and open that up with your son? You know, honestly, I don't I don't recall research ever being a part of our conversation other than there's research being done to find a cure. Uh, looks like research was not heavily discussed um, as the other disciplines. Knowing that what you know now, especially in the age of the highly effective modulator therapy and other new research coming down the pipeline, how would you approach research for you and your son? Honestly, I think Caleb, who's now 11, is more research driven than I am. My protectiveness comes into play, and then I fear that what if he participates in the trial and something more dangerous happens than more good coming from it? But, you know, Caleb said to me when we discussed him starting Trikafta, he wanted to be a part of research because even if it did not work for him, what he went through could help them figure out things to help others. I love how he thinks of others fighting this disease and want to find a cure for them just as much as for himself. He now has me interested in finding out about what the foundation is currently researching. Wow, Caleb is so mature for his age. And it sounds like um, both of you have an opportunity to add the research talk in your future clinic visit agenda. So I was wondering, do you know if Caleb is consented for the CI Foundation patient registry? Um, honestly, Cheyenne, I'm not 100% sure. For previous studies, I know that he was too young to be a part of them. Um, so I really don't know, but I'm trusting that if something does come up, our care team, you know, will mention something to us and we can go from there. I know, I know. You know that being part of the registry, Caleb is participating in CF Research. 
while going to his clinic visit. So the registry includes like the clinic visit encounters, his annual labs, meds, chest x-rays, sputum culture results, genetic mutation, and so on and so forth. Um, these data can be used uh, to see if Caleb is eligible for upcoming research and can be plotted out into view at your care team, such as his FEV1 and BMI trends. So participating in research is not just being in a study. He's already doing it now and helping out the CF community, even at such a young age. Um, how cool is that? Um, I wonder how Caleb would really feel about him being such an integral part of helping out with the finding the cure. You know, Caleb is at the stage in his growth where it's cool to be indifferent. I asked him how he feels about being a part of finding a cure just with reporting or sharing his day-to-day -day life. And his response was, I'm fine with it, as he shrugged his shoulders. Pray for me, folks. I'm not, I'm not ready for this stage. <laughs> yes, I have teenagers too, and they could be super challenging. Um, so, uh, well, you know, they'll eventually come around. At least that's what I've been told. <laughs> um, Cindy, um, for patients like Caleb and Thrania that have not discussed research as much, can you tell us more about how these patients and even new caregivers can introduce and participate in the research world? such as like um, getting consented for the CF patient registry, finding research opportunities in their community, or you know what they're hearing now in this conference like this one. Um, sure. Well, thank you for that introduction. It, this has uh, been really fun to participate with this group of people uh, and listen to other people's stories. My name is Cynthia Brown. I am the sole adult provider in this group. I'm the director at Indiana University, and I'm gonna be talking today about research related to daily care. Over the course of the next few minutes, I want to highlight a variety of different things, but I think one of the pieces of information that's, or one of the pieces of that conversation that really struck out to me um, was Lathronia's discussion about her nervousness to allow her son to participate in research. So over the course of about the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about ways that we can research daily care that may not involve sort of the typical clinical trials. And over this time, I'm going to highlight things from the registry and how that's a great research tool talk about clinical trials like we traditionally think about them, but compare them to some of these tools we're using in daily uh, care. And kind of end by talking about PROMISE, which is one of the observational studies in HERO2. So just kind of give you a flavor of some of the different things going on across the network and end with talking about how you at home can be involved as you in, in, um, enact, act with your care teams. Next slide. So the patient registry that uh, Cheyenne and Lathronia mentioned, this is the model. Y'all, all these other diseases out there, they want to be cystic fibrosis. This uh, registry was initiated more than 50 years ago. Uh, all the care network, all the um, care centers across the network, anytime you have a touch point with them, they're putting data into this registry. Now, we often think about this in our own personal lives, but this has contributed greatly to research. Some of the biggest things that we've learned have come from the registry and the wealth of data. And you can use it, certainly it is used clinically, but we have things like how does nutrition and early life impact lung function? What do you, uh, different mutations, what are the clinical course of different mutations? This allows us to really consolidate that and find out things that there's too few people at any one center to learn. So as I mentioned, the patient registry is personal and powerful for an individual. This is a copy of a printout from a CF SMART report. Many of you may have seen these, but it shows in the individual way what, you, what the registry can provide to you. And your clinical teams are often using these in their pre-visit pre planning to say, oh, look, this person's lung function in this case, if you look across the top, is stable. Their nutrition is stable, but below the goal where we want it. Other times it may be like, you know what, we, we're starting to see a sort of trickle down in lung function, maybe not apparent from one visit to the next, but over the course of a year, it really adds up. It may highlight, um, you know, the dietitian hasn't been in there to see that patient in a year. So you can use this very individually, but it's much bigger than that. Next slide. 
So what types of information are included in the patient registry? Well, it includes things like your diagnosis. When, when were you diagnosed? What was your recent sweat test value? Where was the care received? Was it at home or in the hospital? Was it a telehealth visit? Once a year, we report information such as employment status or your education level, um, what type of insurance an individual may have. And with each encounter, we're, we're pulling in things like which medications do you take? What types of airway clearance are you doing? Do you have any comorbid medical conditions like diabetes or osteoporosis? Um, and very importantly, every piece of lung function, height, weight, what bacteria does an individual grow? It's all there. And it's reported back on an annual basis. You can access it um, online to sort of review in an aggregate sense what's going on in the community. And your centers also receive a copy of the data collected from their patients. And hopefully you're sharing that back with you so that you know how you, how is your center doing relative to make sure making sure individuals are maintaining lung function and sort of meeting the standards of care for CF. Here are some of the highlights of the recent 2020 registry report. On the um, left-hand part of the slide, really kind of highlight some of the clinical care pearls for 2020. And a lot of these we think are related to the influence of Trikafta on the CF population. Remarkably, we saw a, a significant decline in mortality rate. When around the country in 2020, mortality rate was going up because of COVID. In CF, the mortality rate and the predicted survival went up. Over the same time, uh, we saw transplants really decrease and pregnancies really increase. And this is the real world daily care effect of Trikafta. On the right hand side, it's sort of saying, okay, what about this data we collected about the pandemic? And you know, the really interesting thing is this is gonna help inform us years to come as we can collect more and more data related to individuals who are infected with, with COVID over the course of the pandemic. Um, it looks at the, where the clinic visits are occurring before 2020. A virtual care was a very, very limited part of CF care, but now we're, it's being incorporated. So we'll get to use the data collected in the registry for research over the coming years um, as we sort of in continue to investigate the pandemic. So I want to kind of take the registry and use that as a jumping off point to talk about real world research, kind of a, uh, a fancy hot topic term that we've been using. Um, and where does this integrate into clinical trials? And I always think of real world research as really for our real lived lives. So a clinical trial, you have to meet, you, you come in, there's very specific visits, but real world research is different. It is meant to be inclusive. You bring patients with CF and their caregivers in from the very beginning of planning. You want the research to occur a, along with clinical care. And you collect the data from the medical records that come in. And finally, the outcomes kind of in the back end are the ones that are the most important to people with CF, their clinical teams, and importantly, health systems and the, and the caregivers. Next slide. So this graphic kind of shows sort of a continuum, right? Clinical trials operate on one end. That's how we get to new drug approvals. That's how the FDA gets to an important um, approval process for drugs like Trikafta. In clinical trials, there is a burden, right? When you're bringing something new into the market, you have to show that it's safe and effective for the population that's going to be using it. So for that reason, clinical trials have to have very strict inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria just to make sure that, that they're, they're pr both protecting the population of individuals and also including individuals who have a chance opportunity to benefit. But when you participate in a clinical trial, I can understand how Lithronia may be nervous because there is a, a risk of the unknown in that. You know, we don't know going into clinical trials what a side effect might be. It may emerge in some people, but not others. On the opposite side, we have observational real world type research. And a lot of times these are coming in, you know, after a drug's approved, um, or the registry is a good example of this. And HERO2, which I'll talk about, is another example. As I mentioned, these are typical patients that, are, that have minimal inclusion criteria, that we're gathering data within the clinic delivery, clinical care delivery. 
um, and we're collecting data from medical records. And sort of promise, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more, kind of straddles the, the line between a clinical trial and a real world research type trial. It's clearly observational. We're trying to determine in promise how does it work in the real world, but there's predefined study procedures and visits. Next. So on this slide, I've created a table to kind of give a compare and contrast about some of the studies that are going on in the post trichapta world. So Simplify, which is still enrolling, it's almost fully enrolled, and CF Storm, which is going on in the UK, are our typical randomized clinical trials. They are trying to determine what happens if you stop Dornase alpha and, hypertonic, and or hypertonic saline? And the trial tells you, you per patient A is going to stop hypertonic saline, but person B is going to continue it. And when we follow those people out and simplify for a period of 10 weeks, for CF storm for a period of 12 months, what happens to their lung function? What happens to their exacerbation rate? And um, Interestingly, CF Storm is incorporating some components that we think of as the real world research as some of their data is being collected remotely or in clinic visits. On the other side, we have more observational studies. I mentioned PROMISE. PROMISE is looking to see how does Trichapta work and patients taking it in the real world for, for uh, you know, a labeled indication. We're not telling anybody in PROMISE what to change or stop. There's no change. It's whatever is going on, it's happening clinically. The initial study was for two and a half years. They're gonna continue that out for five years. What are the two and five year outcomes for people taking Trikafta? But there are study visits required. And these can be things that um, are going to be above and beyond a typical clinic visit. For instance, sweat chloride is being performed. They're looking at non-pulmonary effects. So looking at stomach pH or gastric motility or glucose tolerance. So there's lots of pieces of information we're trying to learn that require more procedures than would be um, in a typical clinic visit. And finally, uh, sort of on this far end is HERO2. I'm a co-PI of the study along with Clement Wren. And this is just sort of trying to peek into the daily lived experience of individuals with CF. This is sort of a new thing. We're not telling people what to do. We just want to see what they're doing and have them tell us what their symptoms are. And the back, at the end of the study, we are integrating this with the registry to sort of look at the information that people are telling us what's happening to lung, fit, uh, lung function. There are no study visits and all the data is collected remotely. Next slide. So what have we learned? Um, just kind of the things we've learned so far. I can't tell you much about Simplify, except that it's almost fully enrolled. And hopefully by the time we get to NACFC, uh, we'll have some really important data to share from Simplify. From Promise, um, doc, Dr. David Nichols reported this at last fall's NACFC. So if you're interested in seeing his full talk, you can go and watch him on the, the CFF YouTube channel. And he gave some takeaways that we learned in just the first six months of individuals taking Trikafta. So some of his takeaways that he sort of made this top 10 list. Um, first, and not surprisingly, Trikafta has been the most effective drug ever studied, both in the clinical trial as well as an observational trial in the United States. That once individuals start Trikafta, very few people stop it. It's about 95% or more continue on over time. And people are reporting their baseline health status remains good, meaning they have good quality of life, good respiratory quality of life, et cetera. But, and, and if you switched from one modulator like Simdeco to Trikafta, you get further health gains than if you than the prior modulator that you were on. Two F508s were better than one, but a ceiling effect can occur, meaning you can get to a certain peak of your lung function and not get any higher, which makes sense. Biological females had a larger change in sweat chloride versus men. What that means, it's still hard to say. In December 2020, new mutations were added to the FDA label. We didn't have a clinical trial for these mutations, so we're learning how they work in the real world. And one of the initial observations was, yep, their sweat chloride does go down. We're going to have to wait, but Promise will help us know how the medication is working for these new mutations added to the label. 
So ultimately, this is kind of a really good real world study because it's showing that the real world outcomes is really mir mirroring the trial outcomes. Um, and then finally, it's kind of added a tool to our toolbox, letting us know that home spirometry can be an effective part of therapy, but usually does benefit to have some actual video type coaching to make it work. Next slide. So Hero 2 is sort of a new adventure. There's um, this slide didn't quite work like we thought it would because there's some text behind those um, pictures. Um, but what that what the text behind the pictures is supposed to say is that this was really had a lot of first associated with it. This was the first study designed as a real world research study with patients with CF and their and their family members involved in the planning process. This is the first study to incorporate social media as a unique um, lane for recruitment and enrollment. You can enroll directly, you can click a link directly from a Facebook post or an Instagram post and go to the Hero2 landing page and enroll in the study because this is meant to be entirely independent. Independent consent and assent, independent research visit or um, uh, entirely remote data collection through the Folia Health app. So it can be done, the app can be downloaded and used on a phone or you can use it through a computer uh, internet connection. What those pictures on the right do show you is what the Folia Health app looks like. So did you finish your treatments? We wanna know what treatments an individual is reporting that they do. We wanna know specific things about symptoms such as coughing. A very unique piece of this is that the, um, you can add questions that are important to your health. For instance, the most common group of questions is about gastrointestinal health, and you may track the number of bowel movements you have in a day or some other symptoms like gas or bloating, that kind of thing. This will provide a remarkable amount of data over time. Next slide, please. So this kind of highlights some of the data that's collected in HERO2. We collect daily um, tracking. We, we ask you to track every day, but you know we expect that daily tracking is a lot for a lot of people. So if you track for 12 days out of the month, you get two thumbs up from the Hero2 team. Um, we also do monthly review where we ask if you've had any exacerbations or if there have been any treatment um, changes over the past month and look at some more validated measures. And then kind of on the end result, we're integrating that with the outcomes that we're interested in, such as Aiken FBV1. All right, so when we put these slides together back in March, we had already enrolled over 500 people 580 people, and now, as of now, we're over 600 individuals enrolled in HERO2. On the, we have been able to match 94% of those with uh, their patient registry data, and I'd like to highlight the blue bar on this a recruitment and enrollment graphic because this shows the group of people who enrolled entirely via social media, which uh, shows us that this is an important tool for enrollment that the foundation can use for other um, uh, studies in the future. Next slide. And this is just sort of a neat peek here about what people are reporting a, reporting to us when they come into the study. So almost 40% of individuals at the time they enrolled had said since they started Trikafta, they had stopped one of their other daily therapies. And almost one in four individuals reported stopping more than one therapy. So this shows that we're going to learn a lot from these individuals over time. And interestingly, and how this is going to be a great complement to the data collected from Simplify, is the treatment that was most commonly stopped was inhaled antibiotics followed by airway clearance. So this will provide us really important data about how does that affect lung function and exacerbation rates over time. Next slide. So you can contribute. So what are the different ways an individual could contribute? First, you could participate in the CF patient registry. I think this is, a, if you never sign any other informed consent in your entire life, signing the consent to participate in registry could be the single biggest contribution that you could give to daily care in, in across um, your lifetime. So ask your team if you've been consented or not. You may have consented 10 years ago and it kind of slipped your mind, but it's important to know because if you're contributing information about your clinical care encounters, it's important to know. Ask to review that SMART report. If you've never seen a SMART report from a clinical standpoint, it's a very, very interesting piece of data. You can enroll in clinical trials, sort of that traditional research. So Simplify that I mentioned is still enrolling. They, they estimate they'll be enrolling through the early May. 
And you can review all the other clinical trial opportunities. The CFF puts together a great clinical trial finder. You can say, I'm interested in anti-infectives, and it'll show you all the trials that are potentially open in your area. And finally, consider enrolling in real-world research, like HERO2. You can do it entirely online, or you can talk to your care center and, and enroll through your care center. At this point, I'm going to hand off to Dr. Muther, uh, where she's going to highlight uh, some of the additional work that's being done in daily care. Thank you, Cindy, for sharing all the many different ways people living with CF are contributing to a better understanding of what the future of daily CF care will look like. My name is Emily Muther, and I'm a psychologist in the Pediatric CF Center here in Colorado, and I'm very excited to now share a few more examples of other projects that focus on how to improve daily care. So as a psychologist who's part of a pediatric CF care team, I'm really thrilled to be involved and a part of um, sharing updates on the Success with Therapies Research Consortium which is a network of CF partners all working together to develop and improve strategies to manage daily CF care. Additionally, I'll be speaking about the Quest study, which is a different type of research than what Cindy has already discussed, and is collecting the experiences and stories of those individuals who are included in the Simplify trial. And then finally, I'll briefly share a tool that was developed to help improve conversations about daily care between CF care team members and individuals during clinic visits, and a study that's examining a virtual coaching intervention to address what makes it difficult to do all the treatments involved in managing CF. So first I wanna highlight the work of the Success with Therapies Research Consortium. The STRC is a CF foundation sponsored group that's made up of many different types of members, including investigators from CF centers across the country. These are pulmonologists, psychologists, research coordinators. It also includes community members. These are adults living with CF, caregivers of children and adolescents living with CF, partners of those with CF and research staff, both at Boston Children's Hospital and Johns Hopkins, who serve as the data management and study management cores. The mission of the STRC is to engage in clinical research studies of interventions, focusing on sustaining daily care and self-management to improve optimal health outcomes and quality of life for those living with CF. So really the goal of the STRC is to develop evaluate and disseminate interventions that help us better, better measure self-management, that are patient-centered and empower individuals with CF, that are tailored to people's unique strengths and needs, that are feasible, practical, and acceptable, and finally that leverage collaborations and partnerships with family members, care team members, and community. So this graphic really just highlights the level of partnership that exists between the CF Foundation, the individual sites, and the CF care centers who are members of the STRC, and the CF community who are involved at every step of the way. So as you can see um, in the green bar down below, this partnership includes consulting, having CF community members consulting on research questions and the design of the studies that are conducted having community members chairing and participating in the various work group, working groups that are a part of the STRC. We have community members serving as co-investigators on studies, those who are co-authoring presentations and manuscripts, and especially being involved in the presentation and findings that come from the work of the STRC. So as I move on, I wanna just pause briefly to talk a little bit about a different type of research. So we've heard throughout several presentations um, as part of ResearchCon, including the opening keynote from Dr. Sawicki, that research is not only about clinical trials and randomization and blinding and collecting and analyzing of numeric data. Research is also about documenting and improving the lived experiences of individuals within a certain group. Qualitative research is a way of doing this. It's an important and unique aspect of this work because it's meant primarily to capture just that, the individual experiences, the unique differences, and the common themes that exist in those participating in this type of research. 
So qualitative research helps us to be, to be able to tell the stories of individuals and groups and to use things like the CF registry and the information that we're getting from Hero2 and from Simplify to be able to produce and describe what it is, what those unique stories are of those individuals participating. So one very important example of qualitative research is the Quest study, which is the qualitative understanding of experiences with the Simplify trial. Next slide. So the Quest study is looking at the perspectives of individuals participating in the Simplify trial. And as we heard from Cindy, those are individuals who are participating in the Simplify study that is involved in withdrawing from certain aspects of their medication. So as we've heard, these individuals are on CFTR modulators and therefore as part of Simplify, they're withdrawing from certain aspects of their care. This qualitative study involves interviewing those individuals, approximately 120 individuals who are in the Simplify trial will be included in this qualitative study. Um, so that we can better understand what their experiences are as they're withdrawing from certain aspects of their care. Next slide. The goal of the Quest study really is to be able to better describe the feelings and beliefs about treatment withdrawal and treatment burden for those individuals in the Simplify study. So it's not so much to measure and track certain um, aspects or metrics of their lung function or their BMI, but really to understand those perspectives and feelings. Additionally, the Quest study hopes to be able to determine if there are any changes in those perceptions about treatment burden and feelings about withdrawing from medication um, or using or not using Dornay's alpha or hypertonic saline after completing the study. So once completing the study, do individuals' feelings change about whether or not they're using something like hypertonic or Dornay's alpha? The Quest study will be able to capture that, those experiences. Next slide. So as of March, there have been over 100 first round interview, interviews that have been completed as part of the Quest study and 75 second interviews that have been done. This, these interviews will be transcribed and then analyzed for themes that exist to be able to answer those questions about perceptions and feelings of individuals. So you can see how this is an example of really partnering with a clinical trial, the Simplify study, using a qualitative study design to get additional, more unique individual information. Next slide. So one example of the outcome of the STRC and how the findings are being used to improve communication about daily care is the daily care check-in. So the daily care check-in is a tool, as you can see here on the slide, that was developed as part of the STRC that's meant to help facilitate conversations with individuals and families about what it makes it hard to keep up with daily CF care. We know that there are so many factors that impact the daily management of CF, and in order to build strategies to help improve um, daily care, we need to better track what gets in the way. And we know that this is different for everybody. Each individual has a unique set of challenges and barriers, and we need to understand those. So these barriers can vary across time. What might be challenging at one point of time might not be a challenge or a stressor a year from now for example. Therefore, we have to think about recommendations and interventions that are specific, as I mentioned, to each individual's unique circumstances, but also their goals and their own motivation. So we know that there should not be a one-size-fits-all approach, and the daily care check-in helps us better understand these circumstances and not make assumptions as a care team or provide more generalized or blanket recommendations for improving daily care, but really listening and understanding and tailoring recommendations to those unique needs. Next slide. So just to quickly explain how this tool was developed, there was an advisory group that was formed with members of five CF care teams, community members, and CF foundation staff, all who worked on the best ways to use the daily care check-in or the DCC as a tool. And so this, was, this work um, was done across two phases. Phase one involved rolling out the tool to people with CF and using it to initiate conversations during clinic visit. 
testing it, understanding what is it like, what are the challenges, what are some of the logistical or administrative barriers, how does this tool fit into the flow of clinic? Do people like it? Do care team members like it? Do individuals or family members like it? And then phase two has begun to evaluate the quality of these conversations that have been generated as a result of the daily care check-in in order to help us understand how helpful this tool might be. Next slide. And so this really just shows a timeline for all the various stages of the project from validation, testing the use and collecting data to ultimately analyzing the data to better inform how this can be most useful. So I think this is just a nice reminder and visual representation of the many steps that, that all different types of research projects go through to really ensure that the information is accurate to what we were looking at and that it's also meaningful. And, and the ultimate goal for the daily care check-in is that it be available widely in CF centers across the country, hopefully in the fall of, of this year, 2022. Next slide. So finally, I just wanna briefly share an example of a study investigating the feasibility of a virtual intervention to improve daily care in CF. So as we've all lived through the last many changes that have occurred as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the increases in virtual opportunities for us to connect with one another has been a change that I think we want to leverage and understand better as it relates to how can we use these opportunities to maybe help those um, improve their daily CF care. Next slide. So the telecoaching study is a pilot study that used focus groups, focus groups of, of individuals with CF, of caregivers of children with CF, and of CF care team members to all to help inform what is a behavioral intervention that's delivered by members of the CF care team. So this intervention targets an individual's, again, you're noticing a theme in, in my slides, unique barriers. So this is a very individualized intervention that's meant to focus on one person's own unique challenges and what their barriers are to, to managing their daily CF care. So the main goal of this pilot study is to test if this telehealth intervention is feasible and acceptable, if individuals like meeting with a member of their care team who's acting as a coach to help them. Um, and then secondly, to look at any changes that might occur in daily care as a result of participating in the study. So much like the graphic I showed for the daily care check-in, you remember the arrow that showed the different stages that that project has gone through. This um, also highlights, this graphic also highlights the many different aspects of the telecoaching study. So you can see here it includes collecting an individual's treatment patterns, their frequency of currently using their vest, for example, a lot of information around um, collecting what challenges they're experiencing with different aspects of their care, whether it's airway clearance or um, taking their enzymes or their boost nutritional supplements, getting a lot of that information. And then you can see that there are 30 minute virtual coaching sessions that occur as part of this project and study. So one of the unique aspects of this telecoaching study is that it uses both mental health trained and non-mental health trained clinicians on CF care teams who serve as I, as I mentioned, health coaches and teach individuals skills to actually make managing their daily care and addressing some of those barriers a little bit easier. Next slide. So the intervention phase of this study includes 11 sessions with a coach who is someone on their CF care team. So that can be the psychologist, it could be the social worker, but it also could be the respiratory therapist or the nurse or the pharmacist, for example. And these sessions are delivered across a, a six month period of time. So we're enrolling both adolescents and adults who are living with CF and they complete those coaching sessions that are about 20 to 30 minutes and focus on specific skills to target their own barriers to CF treatments. So here you can see in the, in the table, I've put some of the different skills um, that exist as part of this intervention. So things like problem solving, working on stress reduction, increasing motivation, and improving communication, all of which are aimed at an individual's own specific challenges. So for example, if an adolescent says that they're having a hard time managing taking care of their CF, doing their treatments with the pressures of school and all their extracurricular activities, the coach might use problem solving or stress reduction 
during a coaching session to help the adolescent manage those challenges. So this study, much like the HERO2 study, highlights the important shifts in how and where research is being done. So telehealth has increased significantly across clinical and research areas of care. And while there can be some challenges to adapting, um, getting over some of the awkward, awkward hurdles that exist over telemedicine, it does allow us to reach more people who may not have been as able to participate in research or have access to certain aspects of our care in the past. And so with that, I will pass it back to Cheyenne and Lathronia, who are going to help us think more about telehealth, how it impacts our relationships, the pros and cons, and the other ways that partnership is important. Thanks, Cindy and Emily, for sharing your knowledge and bountiful information. And yes, as Emily mentioned, telehealth has definitely uh, become the forefront of clinic visit platforms due to the pandemic. In my opinion, telehealth is great in a pinch, but I'm not a huge fan. If I'm remembering correctly, I think we've done maybe two telehealth visits. I felt that Caleb did not take the visits as seriously as he does when we're in person in the clinic. He was already doing school online, so anything else that was done online, he had no interest in it because he was tired of being online. I've heard similar comments from a few of our patients too. Telehealth can work for some families, but not for others. Um, now that we've heard about uh, care in early childhood and education on research, how would you empower Caleb later as he transitions to young adult and maybe even cut that apron string? You know, with the relationship that we have established, I don't think that it'd be much of a struggle um, to cut the apron strings, so to speak. I feel that I've instilled in him the ability to advocate and speak up for himself. Um, he has a very curious mind, and I would not be surprised by him actually coming to me and telling me that he found research that he wanted to be a part of. Okay. I know this is hard to think so far ahead, but how would you teach Caleb and his future significant other to partner up as they build a life together? <laughs> I, you know, I laugh at this because the thought of, you know, Caleb being old enough to actually have a significant other is something that brings me joy because one, he's alive and thriving to have a partner. And then two, I, and I say this with so much love, Caleb is a jerk. He is <laughs> such a jerk about so many things that uh, it will take a very <laughs> special person to be his partner. I think I'd be more of a uh, support for them in dealing with him. I can't stop laughing. <laughs> I hope, um, I'm glad that you know Caleb so well. I'm not so sure how you, he feels about you announcing that on a national conference. Um, <laughs> however, I'm not sure, um, you know, uh, you know, that would be recorded for his future education to look at. But yes, people with CF are living longer, happier and healthier lives thanks to research. And adulthood will be hard with jobs, starting a family, continual self-care with CF and so many more responsibilities. So how do you envision Caleb and his family juggling all this as an adult with CF? For example, like grandkids when it comes into the picture. I know you would be there for them. And what you would do you see in the future for CF and research? Uh, you know, Caleb's not surprised by anything that I say, so he wouldn't be too bothered by me calling him a jerk on national uh, on a national platform. <laughs> but um, he has expressed uh, wanting to have kids in the future, and uh, with Tricapter, that seems to be happening more and more. Uh, in the future, I think my role would be there, of course, to be to support him and remind him as we we do as parents of how they were when they were a kid. Um, I would hope to think that I'd be able to help him figure out, um, figure out things and making sure he gets treatment while also having time for his family uh, to be there and for be there for him and his family um, to help create a balanced work family treatment life. And, you know, even no matter how old he gets when he has his own little ones running around, I want him to know that I'll be always I'll always be there supporting him and encouraging him to make the choices that will make his life easier for him, even when he is 50. 
Oh my goodness. Um, my heart is so full listening to this. Um, you have opened my eyes and taught me so much in such a short time that we've known each other. You're definitely a role model for your son and his future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as we come to the end of our session, what would you want our audience to take away? You know, I, I would like to, you know, the knowledge that having a unified relationship with your care team and your child, it helps in having a positive and successful daily care routine. You know, this can lead to having a better understanding of what is needed and not only in your personal treatment care plan, but in it will help drive research to getting closer to finding a cure. Knowing that there'll be days or times that we'll stumble, we'll get sick, we'll have bad days, we'll miss a treatment, we'll forget to take medicine, you know, we'll go out and not take our medicine with us. We'll leave a machine at home and have to schedule treatment at another time. It's still okay. All of that is okay. And on the other side with taking Trikafta, you feel great. You're, I don't need to take my medicine. I don't need to do my treatment, but we still have to do it until the research proves otherwise. You know, I want, I want them to know that your care team is there not to judge them, but to help them. So don't be afraid to tell them the truth. Don't tell them what you think they want to hear, but tell them what you're really going through so they can help you figure out a way to get to where you need to be. Yes, yes. We are all part of the same village. We care for each other individually and we strive to have the same goal. So thank you so much for sharing your story and the power to raise a strong and responsible child that advocates for himself and is curious to learn and about what to come. So thank you so much, Lathania. Thank you so much, Shania, for helping me share our journey. You know, now we'd like to open it up for questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A and we'll get into as many as we possibly can. We do have a question already submitted. Um, and oh, looks like it's for me. What advice can you give as a new mother with a baby who has CF? Um, and please, uh, Cheyenne, if you have any input or researchers, if you have any input, please add to this. But my advice to any new parent uh, with a child that's just been diagnosed is find out as much information as you possibly can and share with your, your uh, care team because they're there for your support to help you. Your biggest struggle, you may think may be fighting this disease, but it's actually going to be getting your family and friends to understand this disease because your life is completely different. It's not going to be like any other newborn mom. And it's like, hey, everybody come see my baby. It's going to be, you know, I need to make sure you're not sick. I need to make sure you do this. And they're not going to get that. So as soon as you get your footing firm and you understand everything that you guys are about to encounter, start teaching them. If you can have a family member who you think is having a difficult time understanding what you and your baby are about to go through, have them sit in at a clinic visit so they can answer the questions and hear it right from them and not from some, as much as I love Facebook, Facebook is not the answer for a lot of this thing. So you'll have someone that will look at Facebook and say, oh, it's just this and they'll, they'll grow out of it. Mm, no, not gonna grow out of it. And I think, you know, if you are comfortable with that knowledge and you know the information that you're going to deal with and dealing with them because some feel like they lose family members because how they have to treat their kids with this disease. And, you know, if you just, there are going to be days that you're going to be angry with yourself. You're going to be upset. And those days are okay. It's all right. You still look at your precious baby love up on them, hug up on them, and you'll get through and go to the next day. And those who are not there that don't understand, it's their loss. But how? no matter what, your care, your care team, they are there to help you, help you work through what, even if you think it's a stupid question, they won't tell you it's a stupid question, but they will happily answer it with, answer it with a big smile on your face and say, what else you got for me? So that's my advice. <laughs> 
That was awesome, Lathania. And being the pediatric coordinator, and we deal with a lot of new babies and mommies and daddies here, um, I just want to say, yes, we're going to be family. We're going to be your extended family. Please lean on us. We are here to support you in every single way. And yes, please ask us questions and don't um, depend on Facebook. As Lathania says, uh, we will give you uh, specific sites or information that will help you get you the right information um, and, and take care of you guys. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. But just know we treat you guys individually. It's not cookie cutter. So we will customize care and everything to make sure that we meet your um, child's needs. So and partner with you. Awesome. We have another question. And Cindy, this might be uh, one that you can tackle. It is difficult to depend on another person to help you with your physical therapy. In my case, I live alone, so I have to do everything by myself. How can I have very good daily care for myself? That's a great question. And I think it's very important that, um, again, having an open dialogue with your care team. You'll hear this probably from each and every one of us. It's that open dialogue with your care team that helps make it work. So it's figure out what are the things that you have to do every day to maintain your health versus, you know, are there things in there that might be optional? So, and then organize yourself around it and then kind of create, so whether it's, am I having trouble getting in airway clearance and exercise? Well, maybe you don't have to do both. Maybe you can do airway clearance or exercise or one airway clearance and one exercise. So it's really talking to your care team and trying to figure out where is the pieces where you struggle. Maybe it's creating something like Dr. Muther does with a daily care uh, check-in, like a checklist that you that helps you stay organized. They're, they're going to, and, and let's be honest, there are going to be days you don't feel like doing everything. And <clears throat> you have to, when, when you have those days or you're so busy because you've gone, because you know, you made a you made a choice that it was really important to go visit friends out of town or go to this a, a specific event, and you may not get everything in that day. So it's important to give yourself grace when you don't get everything in. That you know that's okay because the other choices you made may have been really important for your mental health. But it's trying to figure out sort of all the pieces to make real life fit with what you think you need to do, and not beat yourself up when you don't make it happen every day. Because no care team really expects everything to happen every day. Yeah, I agree. I just want to echo what Cindy said. As as the psychologist, I think we know a lot about. Um, motivation and different ways that we do tend to beat ourselves up and and end up feeling guilty or ashamed or bad or or um, like we've failed we've set expectations for ourselves that maybe aren't realistic and what we know is those negative feelings actually cause us to want to avoid things even more so for myself when i have goals of <clears throat> exercising more or not eating donuts when they're in the break room at work and i actually have a donut if I beat myself up, then I'm more likely to just say, well, screw it. I might as well just go to, you know, Chipotle for lunch because I already had a donut. But if we can give ourselves grace, like Cindy said, and we can set really small, achievable, realistic goals and celebrate when we're able to make those successes and work on, you know, in terms of your physical therapy, not saying, OK, I need to do it seven days a week or even five days a week. I'm going to start with just thinking about one or two days that I can fit it into my schedule. And maybe you don't know yet what days those are, but you're gonna kind of just start by focusing on a couple times and seeing how that goes. And, and building upon those successes will help us feel more motivated and, and able to make some of those changes. Yeah. We have another question that was submitted from registration. And um, this is one that Emily, I think uh, you can help me answer. How can or does your social worker best help you? Um, I can only speak for myself, and I know that my social worker with our care team, she is awesome. Um, she does um, a little mini check-in, like, how you doing? And just her smile and her personality, like if I go into clinic, even though it's for Caleb, I still feel like she's like, she cares about what's going on with me. And that smile will kind of perk me up. 
And um, just recently I had an issue with um, Caleb's social security and I emailed her real quick a question and she came back with so much information that was, I was like, wow, I didn't even know any of this existed that put me on the right path to get me to the help that I needed. And in no way did she ever make me feel like I was failing in some way. It just made me real comfortable to know that I could trust her and be able to ask her any question, whether it was related to Caleb or even for myself personally. I love hearing hearing about your relationship with Ronia with the social worker at your care center because I think it's such an important person or people and role on our care teams. And I think sometimes we don't always know all of the different things that the social worker can do to help and support us. And I think with Ronia, you gave several examples of some really tangible, concrete ways that social workers can help provide support with recommendations or resources or tools or things that can help make um, certain things just a little bit easier. But I also think a really important role of the social worker is to provide that emotional support. And, and you're right, Lathronia, it's not just for, for those parents who have, who have um, children and adolescents it is for you as well, because we know that the more that as as parents that we can manage and take care of our own emotional health, the better our children are. And so I think that really um, using the social worker as a support, as a person who can provide resources, but also provide that emotional support, um, talk to you about ways that you can set goals and to improve your daily care, help you think through barriers and challenges that get in the way of maybe meeting those goals that are really important to you. I think the social workers also um, help help us check in on our mental health and well-being. And so understanding the relationship between stress, anxiety, depression, um, feeling overwhelmed, and our physical health. And I think that the social workers provide a lot of support in that way as well. Well, one of the things we've learned at our center is that um, they do so many things that our families don't even really know when and how to ask for their help and support. So it might be worth just kind of starting to ask your social worker, what are some of the things that, that you do um, with other patients or other families so that you can make sure that you can utilize all of the support and resources they offer? Totally agree. Very important part of the team. We have another question. This one is submitted from one of our audience members today. I currently live in Germany. Is there any way you could recommend to contribute to CF research from here? Cindy, maybe you can address that. Wow, that's a great question, and I haven't really thought about re CF research in Germany. Um, however, I think I, I can think of a couple of things. Um, just one thing to highlight some of these um, uh, research trials like Hero2, we are not recruiting ex-US outside of the United States. However, Germany has its own registry. Um, I quickly pulled it up. There are over 6,000 people participating in the German CF patient registry. So if you're not a member of the registry, contribute your data. This is really, I'll tell you, this is really important pieces of information because very, a, a lot of studies, right? Like we compare the U, how people in the United States perform to how people are performing in Canada. Like this provides excellent information about CF here around the world. There are also trial registries from, from other countries. So I mentioned the CF patient finder, but a CFF uh, clinical trials finder, but there will be something similar where you're living that will help you be able to find uh, trials that are potentially open to you. I've got another question for you, uh, Cindy, that was submitted during registration. Based on the very beneficial results from many CF patients are experiencing due to Trikafta, what parameters will clinics use as a basis to reduce the frequency of airway clearance treatments? So the data is being collected currently, right? So if you're going to wait, if you if you're the type of person who wants to wait until research says that it is safe to stop X therapy or decrease X therapy then you're probably going to wait another year or two to know till we get actual trial data to say it's safe to do this. But, uh, you know, I can tell you in my own clinical practice, every, almost every clinic somebody is reporting to me, you know what, I, I don't really feel like that's as helpful to me as it used to be. 
And what I, my response to, to patients is, we don't know, we don't have the research one way or the other to say that this is safe or not safe. If you feel like you want to make a change, we'll work together. We will, I think the thing that you always need to think about is the care center is your safety net. If you're following up every three months and we're maybe making small changes here and there, we're going to see what happens. If for so in my own clinical practice, when I see an individual may have stopped an airway clearance or decreased an airway clearance, and then the next time they come back, there's a decrease in lung function, then we know, okay, you really do need that. And then the other sort of caveat I put on that is when you are well, you may not need the same amount of airway clearance treatments as you used to. But if you get a cold, if you get sick, you need to go back. You got to get, you know, you got to get on it right away. You may feel congested, et cetera, because just because Trikafta has made a difference, it hasn't, if, if you've lived, and you know, I'm an adult provider, if you've lived 50 years with your CF, there's some underlying damage to your lung. And if you get sick and you make mucus because now you have gotten a viral respiratory infection and it's down in your chest, then you are gonna need those airway clearance treatments. So you may not need it every day, but you, you may need it some days. And then just to piggyback off of Cindy being the respiratory therapist on the PEED side, we get that too. And um, there are so many people on your team to talk about, you know, whatever case by case, whether it be your provider like Cindy or a respiratory therapist like myself or any other factors, um, you know, there somebody's got an open ear to, to work with you and to make sure that we um, take care of you the best we can, you know, even if it's on airway clearance. I'm loving this audience participation that we have today. I've got another question that maybe both Emily and Cindy can tackle. Hello, I am an occupational therapy student completing my doctoral degree and the DCC assessment tool is promising as an opportunity to introduce the profession into the multidisciplinary care team in the clinic. Has an OT been involved in the development of the tool? is a great question and I love hearing about all the different disciplines that are a part of and continue to be added to the CF care team. I think it's really wonderful. So uh, formally, I, to my knowledge, there was not, I, I, I'm pretty confident in saying there was not an occupational therapist that was part of the groups that helped develop and then implement the daily care check-in. But I do think just, just as you alluded to in your question, I do think that it can and should be used as a tool to help facilitate conversations and introductions into the roles that we serve on the care team. Just like the mental health screening that we do every year for our adolescent patients is not just about assessing depression or anxiety symptoms, but also about opening the door to have a conversation about stress or mental health or emotional well being. Um, I think the daily care check in can be used in the very same way. So, as the occupational therapist, who may be new to the team or as you're educating families about your role, I think using the daily care check-in to talk about um, where people might be struggling, what some of those barriers and challenges are and how occupational therapy could help. I think it's a wonderful idea. Did you want to add anything, Cindy? No, I, I think, right, we have, a, we have a wealth of people who can provide great information. While we haven't incorporated occupational therapy historically into the clinical care team. I think we need to be open and receptive when we see a need. Um, and you, I can think of a few opportunities in some inpatients that, that were having frequent exacerbations in the past. And we were trying to understand, actually including occupational therapy kind of helped us and, and was losing weight. And the occupational therapist helped us understand in this individual um, that she struggled with putting pills into a pill box, right? Like, so sometimes occupational therapy is a, a may not be something we use commonly, but we need to make sure it's part of the tools in our toolbox. Awesome. We've got another question from an audience member. There is a real hesitancy to participate in research from groups underrepresented in clinical trials and research. Any advice for individuals hesitant to talk to their care team about research? So I will just say, I just came from our um, an annual research retreat, our spring meeting for the CFF Therapeutic Development Network, which is our research arm 
Um, and a lot of the conference was how do we approach uh, underrepresented groups to make sure that they feel safe and represented in clinical trials. So I would flip that question, is it advice for individuals hesitant to talk to their care teams, but what makes care teams hesitant to talk to individuals? I think it can be really hard to you for the individual with CF or the parent of CF to put themselves out there for research. And really the onus should be on the care teams to make sure that research is open and inclusive to all individuals in their care center. And I would just add, I think it's important. Um, it's so it's so important that we're having these conversations that it's embedded and included now in um, research meetings and, and conferences and presentations and, and moving forward and thinking about how do we change the representation that occurs in clinical trials and other research studies. But I also think acknowledging just what this question does, which is there is a lot of reasons for underrepresented um, individuals to, to not have trust and, and, and experiences that have happened historically where they've either been excluded or um, not been able to be um, protected as part of participation in research. And so I think that acknowledgement, that historical context is really important as researchers um, so that we can start the conversation. And I agree with, with Cindy 100%. I think the, the onus should be on, um, on care team members to, to help the experience feel more comfortable and safe. And hopefully we're headed in that right direction. I really love that this question was submitted. Um, it, it touches on so many things for me personally. And, but with my care team, I swear if I could copy my care team, I'll add Shine in as well and um, just duplicate them into other agencies and other, um, you know, clinics. They're, they're so great. And we have got, we've got such a relationship and it did not it does not feel forced it doesn't feel like they are making me do anything and they actually want my input on the care of my child they they really want to foster that trust between me and them so that you know if they came to me with a um research opportunity that i felt comfortable enough to say yes i want to take a part of it because i know they have our best interests at part my my big my biggest thing if i could talk to care teams all over would be to say foster that trust get to know them and i know you know as clinicians you have a lot of people but just it just takes one person on the team to get to know that family and it'll spread throughout and make them feel a little more comfortable but I'm gonna step off my soapbox right now because we're about to run out of time. Um, I just want to thank you guys so much um, for you know what you've done here. But before we close, we want to draw your attention to some ways that you can be involved in upcoming projects about daily care. Community Voice comprises people from across the CF community to bring their unique insights and priorities to the forefront of research, care, and programs. When you join Community Voice, you receive tailored opportunities catered to your interest from answering surveys to joining committees that you can do from the comfort of your own home when you have time. We've put the Community Voice link in the chat, so feel free to learn more there and sign up to provide your feedback. Thank you for all of our, our speakers for sharing their knowledge and insight about let's build the future of daily care together. And thanks to all of you for your attention and your questions. There are many wonderful resources related to all of the event sessions on the research page. For this session, you'll find the slides we shared and other items the speakers thought you might find valuable. Please spend some time exploring the resources and download anything that you want to keep. We have an expo booth and a networking session open for the next 45 minutes. In the expo, you can visit CF Foundation staff to learn about a number of foundation research initiatives or visit one of two Meet the Speakers booths where you interact with Dr. Rasha Jane and Melissa Schiffman from the Is It My Age or Is It CF session or Shine and Pi and me. If you are more interested in meeting with ResearchCon attendees, visit the networking tab, which is a fun 
feature that allows you to connect with others and get randomly matched with other attendees for a five minute video conference. This attendee can be a clinician, a CF community member, a researcher, or a CF foundation staff member. You never know who you're gonna get. It has been my pleasure and honor to be a part of this and to share Caleb's and my journey with cystic fibrosis. Being a parent is not easy. And to add to the mix, being a caregiver to a child with CF, that just makes the job a little more difficult. But with our care team and with the work that the foundation is doing today and tomorrow, I hope that like me, you are able to walk away from this session today with seeing the light and hope that we're closer to a cure and it will help and it will happen because of those gathered here today. Thanks again for coming to learn about building the future of daily care together. We hope to see you at the closing keynote about genetic therapies on the horizon, which begins in about 45 minutes at 3.15 Eastern Standard Time.